All right, going to be doing sort of a unique study today. Had a conversation with Brother Jacob Thompson about a subject here, and he sent me some notes that he wrote up and uh, said, if you want to preach it, that's fine. He said, I, I don't have time to put this thing together right now. And I looked over it, and I said, yeah, you know, you really made some good points there. Lord showed you some good stuff. I don't often do this, but uh, I thought I would do this today. Um, the sun is Jehovah's body. Hmm. Jehovah God appears, the word Jehovah appears seven times in your Old Testament. New versions, I think the NIV removes all seven references. Okay, they come up with this weird false god name of Yahweh, you know, um, which is kind of funny because within Jehovah you have basically three, you know, syllables there. So Yahweh is just two. Kind of an interesting thing. But um, I'm going to read through his notes that he sent me here, and I'm going to give my own comments and my own commentary. We're going to look at the scriptures. Okay, um, it's not about my words or Jacob's words or whoever, you know, it's, it's, well, I like the style of it. It's about the Bible. What does the Bible teach? So let's go through what he wrote here, and um, I'll read it to you, and then we'll go look up at the scriptures and see if what he's saying is accurate. Okay, let's begin here. Um, the Bible is clear that God is one person. Absolutely. There's not one reference in your King James Bible to persons, plural, in reference to the Godhead. Not one. When God created man, he created them in his likeness and image. According to the Bible, man has a spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is where it talks about. He has it referenced here. Genesis 2.7, I talked about the thing of let us make man in our image. And then it says, so God made it man in his image. So, you know, the Trinitarians get all excited and they say, see, it says God made man, you know, he's saying, let's make man in our image. Um, and they say, see, he's talking, you know, Father's talking to the Son or the Holy Spirit or whoever's, you know, the three persons are talking. Um, then why does he say image singular? <laughs> all right. Uh, are they identical triplets? Well, you know, if you're a Catholic, I did a, uh, one of my videos on that, the Trinity exposed thing. They actually have paintings of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all as triplets, identical triplets. It's kind of funny. But uh, it's His image, singular. Okay? The body, soul, and spirit can speak to one another. But that doesn't mean that there are three separate persons, three separate beings, you know, or three separate gods. Okay, very un important to understand that. Well, obviously, the Holy Spirit is the spirit there. And the Father, God the Father, is the soul. People say, well, the Bible says, you know, um, you know, God is a spirit. Okay. They say, well, see there, Father is a spirit. That proves it. Uh, no, it just simply is stating a fact. God is a spirit. God is a soul. God is a body. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say God is three spirits or, you know, whatever else. Three separate spirits and three separate persons. Uh, no, God is a spirit. God is also a body. God is also a soul. You know, what Jesus is saying there to the woman at the well, he's just simply saying, oh, God is a spirit. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father and the Son are. Okay, you see that? So, get back to the notes here. He says, so then that leaves the Son. The only part left would be the body, obviously. So does the King James Bible teach that Jesus is the body? Yes. Verses proving Jesus is the body. John 1.18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Okay? He writes here, this verse from first glance is an obvious contradiction. If you don't quite understand what's going on there. There are plenty of times in the Old Testament where the Bible makes clear, or makes plain that people did in fact see God. And then he references his study here on the glory of the Lord, which I do recommend very much that people watch Brother Jacob Thompson's video on the glory of the Lord proving conclusively that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. Uh, really an incredible study, some really deep things the Lord showed him there. I will put links to that study down in the description box. There are so many times when God physically showed himself to people and his physical appearance is given. He referenced uh, Exodus 24 verses 9 through 18. So how does one reconcile the contradiction? Okay. There's clearly times in the Old Testament, in other words, where people see the glory of the Lord, and yet John 1.18 there says, No man hath seen God at any time. All right. What's going on? Well, what you're seeing there, when the Bible says no man hath seen God at any time, it's talking about the Father, the soul. Okay. 
But when you see Jesus Christ, you're seeing the Godhead. You are seeing God. So, you know, that's how you reconcile that thing. Colossians 1.15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? All right, Jesus Christ, in other words, in reference to him there. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You know, it's, it's really when you get into this whole debate, this Trinity thing versus the Godhead of Scripture, it's really not that difficult. You just read and believe what the King James Bible says. Now, I, I'll grant you, there's parts of the Godhead that you kind of have to step, step back and say, okay, mystery of godliness is great. I don't understand that part of it. But to understand what the Bible teaches, you know, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It's not that hard. He's not a separate person, and he's not a triplet. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, talking about Jesus again, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Colossians 3.10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Speaking of Jesus Christ. Souls are invisible. Okay, you're not going to be able to see a, a soul in terms of... Um, you know, it's, it looks like some kind of a separate person or whatever. It has its own body of flesh. That's not the case. It's not what the Bible teaches. And he writes here, When someone looks at me, they are not seeing me, as in the soul. They are seeing the body. This is the same with God. If I were to look upon God, I would not be able to see the Father. John 5, 37, Exodus 33, 20. He has referenced. I would only see the Son, the body. Okay. Not only do we have these plain scriptures, the Bible explicitly says that the Son is in reference to the body. Let's see. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Okay? The first place comes in John 6 where Jesus, out of his own mouth, says he is the body. Hmm. Let's look at this. John chapter 6, verse 22. Turn there, turn there in your King James Bible. I was actually going to, I looked at his notes and I said, you know, I'm going to do a separate study on this, you know, because there's a lot of different tie-ins that he doesn't get into in this. And I might do that in the future. But uh, this is some pretty phenomenal stuff. John chapter 6, verse 22 through 27. He writes here, This is to get some context. After doing miracles, some of the Jews seek him out. However, they are coming for the wrong reasons. Jesus tells them to labor for, quote, the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. The Son gives everlasting life. Let's read here. John chapter 6, verse 22 through 27. Let's see what he was talking about here. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that, they, that there was none uh, other boat there, save that one whereunto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus was, went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place, where they did eat bread. After that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the, that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Okay? He's telling them something spiritual. He's saying, hey, the, the fishes and loaves that I gave you, that's not what you should be laboring for. You should be laboring for that spiritual flesh. Okay? What's he referring to? What is the flesh of the Godhead? You see? The Spirit is the Holy Spirit. That's very obvious. The soul is the Father. What's the flesh? Jesus Christ. Hmm. Verse 28 through 40. He writes here, Jesus then further expounds what he started to say. You are to believe on him that is sent, which Jesus then plainly reveals to be the Son. Jesus then declares he is the bread of life. Moses and company were shown a sign by God by feeding them bread from heaven, the manna. Verse 38 teaches, which is further defined by the context, that Jesus is not created. He has always existed. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 talk about that. 
God has always had a body, which Jesus further declares. Let's read the scriptures. John chapter 6, verse 28, down through verse 40. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Who's he referring to? He's referring to himself. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Bread from heaven. Jesus Christ comparing himself to bread. We're going to see this. All right? He came from heaven. They're saying, what sign do you show us? In the Old Testament, we got bread from heaven to eat. Okay? Verse 32, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Hmm. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They're not getting it. He's standing right there referring to himself. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Makes it clear. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay? Um, let me ask you a question. Did you eat breakfast this morning? Lunch? Supper last night? Whenever you're watching the video? Um, if you're saved, do you hunger? Do you thirst? Physically? Yeah. How about spiritually? Do you hunger and thirst for something else other than Jesus as a Christian? No. When you get saved, he's all sufficient. You don't say, well, you know, yeah, I got Jesus, but I wish that there was another God out there. I wish that there was something else, another, another thing, another truth, you know. I mean, the Bible doesn't say Trinity, so I, hopefully, you know, maybe there's something else out there. Oh, hey, Trinitarian philosophy. Yay. <laughs> No, the Lord gave you everything that you need right here. And you don't hunger and thirst for other things. Hmm. Verse 36, But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. You say, we'll see two different wills there. That's, that's just, uh, you know, that proves two different gods. <laughs> People are so weird. They come up with this stuff. Verse 39. No, it doesn't, by the way. Okay. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that, all, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise, raise it up again at the last day. Interesting, because Jesus later on talks talking to, to, I think it's Martha, you know, at the grave of uh, Lazarus, and he says, he says, I am the resurrection and life. I will raise it up here. I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Jesus is the resurrection. Hmm. Verse 40, And this is the will of him that hath, excuse me, this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Yeah, that's what we're looking forward to as Christians, by the way. We're looking forward to the resurrection, not the revelation of the Antichrist. Okay? But is it clear here who Jesus Christ is talking about, spiritually speaking? He's, he's not saying, you know, you'll, you, you come to me, and I got this special packaged bread of life. You eat it, and you'll never be hungry again. That's not what he's talking about. He's not speaking physically. He's saying, I fed you with, you know, the fishes and the loaves and things, and you're hungry again. You see? But if you come to me, I'll give you the true bread of life. They say, what is this bread of life? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If you come and you believe in me, then you're not ever going to want anybody else. You see? It's all sufficient. Unless you're a Catholic, then you got to keep going back for more and more and more bread and, and wine and bread and wine and bread and wine. You know, every time you, you, you know, go to the bathroom after you get back from Mass, well, then you've lost Jesus and you've got to go back for Him again. You're just always hungering for that. A little dense up there. <laughs> the papists I'm talking about. Verse 41. Jacob writes here, This further adds to the fact that God has always had a body. It was never created. 1 John 4, verses 1 through 6. That's correct. Therefore, the Jews were questioning Jesus because they were looking at His 
you know, human flesh. Uh, there are they are expecting to see God with glorious body, not sinful flesh, or I would not say sinful flesh, but not corruptible flesh, because Jesus didn't sin. But let's read here, verses 41 through 43. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They had a problem with that. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. I know what you're saying. I know what you're thinking. Hmm. A little bit of a problem there. Verses 40 through, 44 through 46. He writes, This is similar to what Jesus said in chapter 5. If the Jews actually believed what the Old Testament said, as they assert they did, then they should have believed on Jesus. We also see that the Father cannot be seen unless you are of God, because if you believe who Jesus claimed to be, then you have seen the Father. Again, it's all through the book of John. Let's read here, verses 44 through 46. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. He keeps getting all of this thing on the resurrection. I will raise him up. I will raise him up. I will raise him up. And you look at the scriptures, and it's actually Jesus raises himself up. But other places it says the Father's going to raise him up. You know, quite fascinating. He is the Father. It's one being named God. Okay, just one being. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Jesus is the Father. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Philip comes to him. A couple of chapters later, chapter 8 I believe it is, and he says, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus says, have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast, not, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You get it when you're saved. If you're lost, you don't understand that. You have to demote Jesus Christ and say, well, he's not the Father. He's kind of a separate person and whatever else. You're tearing Jesus Christ down. You're rejecting the flesh of God. Interesting. John chapter 6, verses 47 through 51. Again, reading from his notes here. This is where Jesus gets very plain. We are told to believe on him for everlasting life, and he plainly says again that he is the bread of life, which came down from heaven. Verse 51 is plain and says that bread is his flesh. That is, how, that is who the Son is. The Son is the flesh that was sent by the Father. The context is key to the following passage because the Catholics take this to justify their mass. Okay, let's read verse 50, or 47 here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. <laughs> Just, you know, let me make it plain. I am that bread of life. I am the one that was sent down from heaven. Okay? Your fathers did eat uh, manna in the wilderness and are dead. That miraculous stuff, the, the manna that came down from heaven, that miraculous stuff, you know, gift of God, they ate it, and it was good for them back then and everything else, but they died. Okay? There's a new bread here that's even better than that. Speaking spiritually. Um, verse 50. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The flesh dies on the cross. The flesh of God. God was manifest in the flesh. God hath purchased us with his own blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. You see how the whole thing works out? But people reject the flesh. John chapter 6, verses 50 through, 52 through 59. He writes here, The previous passage defines what Jesus was talking about. He didn't mean that we are to literally eat and drink him, his flesh and his blood. In other words, that's, you know, he has here, that's called Satanism. Well, uh, more accurately, cannibalism. Of course, he knows that. But I'm saying um, eating, you know, living flesh and the blood thereof and things is condemned. 
in the Old Testament, New Testament, and also into the future there. So you're not supposed to do that. All right. And of course, Jesus Christ is physically there. He doesn't say, come on, everybody, come on up, eat it. You know, here, who wants a bite? Who wants, who wants some forearm here? How about some, you know, bicep or, you know, I have a little bit of thigh meat down here or some. He doesn't tell anybody to eat his physical flesh and drink his literal blood, physical blood. He's speaking spiritually. And he doesn't say, you know, go to the Catholic priest because he possesses the right words in Latin to turn bread and wine into flesh and blood. You know, but still with the taste and appearance of, you know, a wafer and wine. But it's actually blood and flesh. You know, <laughs> he doesn't do that. Uh, eating and drinking him is synonymous with believing on him. Verse 56 is important for later. Verse 57 uh, throws in a wrench for Catholic Mass, which we'll be reading here in just a minute. If Jesus were talking about eating his flesh, then does that mean he eats of the Father? Obviously not. The context is believing on Jesus. If Jesus lives by the Father, then believing on Jesus means you are believing on the Father. Amen. Perfect. The point, though, is Jesus, the Son, is the body. Here are some more. Uh, here's some more to prove that. But let's let's read here the uh, these verses, John chapter six, verses fifty through two through fifty nine. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're thinking physical. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He keeps going through this thing, the, the resurrection, the resurrection. The body of Christ, when it's established, the next event is, Okay, Jesus dies on the cross, buried, rises from the dead, ascends back up to heaven. He says, go out, preach the word there. The next thing for the body of Christ is the resurrection. Dead and living saints go up to be with him. Not the revelation of the Antichrist. Okay, that is satanic heresy. Verse 55, For my, my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. You know, and they're, what, you know? And look what he says here, verse 57. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Yeah, Jesus doesn't eat the Father. Okay? He's one with the Father. And you study the Scriptures, the Bible plainly teaches that all three parts of the Godhead are in a Christian. We're one flesh, you see, with the flesh of God. And you have to believe that. You have to believe on Jesus Christ, the flesh. You see. And then when you eat and drink of that flesh, meaning when you're believing on Him there, then you're not going to want anything else. There is no other God or other, no other religion or whatever other kind of thing to believe on that will satisfy you as a Christian. But it's very interesting. If you look down at John chapter 6, verse uh, 66... From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting, too, because if you go back to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, and you go through, and as they're going there through the wilderness and everything, a lot of the people start to complain about the flesh that God is sending down from heaven, about the manna. And they're saying, I wish we could go back to Egypt. The leeks and onions and things back there in Egypt. Boy, we sure were eating good back there in the world, Egypt being a type of the world. I thought that Jesus was saying, if you get the bread from heaven, you won't have any hunger or thirst for the way things used to be. You truly get saved, when you truly get born again, you're not going to have a hunger and a thirst for the things of the old life back there, okay? You want this, the new life in Christ. I'm not saying you won't fall sometimes and mess up and go back over here and do something stupid, but if you do, you're going to say, boy, that was a dumb thing to do. I'm sorry, Lord, I can't believe I fell for that again. Please help me to go over here again. That's why lost people can't stand the new birth. Because they don't want to leave this life over here, the old man. They don't want that. They don't want to partake of the flesh of God. You see? They say, 
Oh, I tried that. It's kind of, yeah, I don't really like the taste of it too much. But boy, Egypt, oh, the food in Egypt. Oh, that, 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 the stuff that the world offers out there, the television, the movies. I like going out to the bars, getting, you know, a little bit of, you know, mm hmm. Yeah. They don't really want the truth. They don't really want Jesus Christ, the flesh of God. You understand? Ephesians chapter 5. Turn there in your King James Bible. Ephesians chapter 5. Look at my camera battery here. Um, whoop. One page too far. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Paul writes about now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So I thought you get saved when you believe. Well, sure, absolutely. Two-thirds of you. But the resurrection, um, it's nearer every day. You get closer to it. Looking forward to it. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Um, are you practicing holiness? How's that uh, sanctification going in your life? Getting rid of things that are sinful? You know, the devils out there, these devil spirits, they always, they're always coming and speaking through these people out there, the heretics on YouTube, and they say, well, um, if you condemn sin, then that means you have to stop that sin in order to truly be saved. Therefore, you're preaching work salvation. You think to yourself, really, this is how desperate you people are getting. Well, it's not really desperate. It's just devils speaking through some of these heretics out there. Um, you know, condemning sin is part of life as a Christian. That's what holiness is all about. Okay? <laughs> Weird people. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You see it there. We're partakers of his flesh. You see? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Yeah. Ephesians 5, well, we already read that. Um, within this passage he has written here, uh, there are a lot of different things about God, but we are focused on the body. Verse 23 defines the church as the body. This lines up with other verses to prove this. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Okay, yeah, we are one flesh with Jesus Christ. We've partaken of his flesh, you see. Um, he has written here, Christ, oh, first he refer, referred, references uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. Then he says, Christ has one body and has a body, of, and those members are the invisible things of him. Romans 1, verse 18 through 25. The point is, the body is Christ. Colossians 1, 18. Um, but then he talks about here in Ephesians 5, he says, verse 25 further defines itself. The church is the body, and the verse says he gave himself for it. When Jesus died on the cross, the body was killed. That was prepared for the sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 speaks of that. Verses 28 through 30 then makes it clear the wife is compared to the church. Christ loves the bride, therefore he loves his own body. Verse 30 is clear. Jesus is the body and we are a part of it. This ties in with John 6 verse 56. By believing on Jesus, he then dwells in us in the form of the Holy Ghost. John 14 verse 16 through 18. Romans 8 verses 9 through 11. Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. And we dwell in him, which verse 30 is teaching. Yeah, and he has simple. Yeah. If these verses didn't prove that the Son is the body, these passages will. In these passages, things like the Trinity, modalism, and all the other pagan garbage will be absolutely obliterated, all the while proving the true Godhead. 
Okay, now this is an interesting point. Right, this is one of those head scratching things of the mystery of godliness. You kind of say, okay, I see it there, but man, oh man. Uh, very interesting. Daniel chapter 7. Go back there in your King James Bible, back to the Old Testament. The book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 14. Daniel 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand um, stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Hmm. Who is it that judges in the future? Jesus Christ, judgment seat of Christ for Christians, and the great white throne judgment for everybody else. And then the, well, that should, I should say, judgment seat of Christ, judgment of the nations on the earth, Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, and then the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20. Verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld it even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Revelation 19 talks about that. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Um, and, there was given on, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed." So you have the Ancient of Days, and you have the Son of Man. Hmm, there. Um, or I should say, one like the Son of Man. Okay? Interesting. Um, I'll read what he has written here. Verse 9 is very important and ties in with the glory of the Lord's study, as this fits the description of Jesus in His glorified body in Revelation 1, 13 through 18. And again, you compare Revelation 7, Revelation, or excuse me, Daniel 7, Revelation 1. And you'll see what he's talking about here. It's the same being that's being described. In that passage, the phrase, um, like unto the Son of Man, is used. This will be important in a moment. Verse 10 is directly quoted also in Revelation. Save that for later. Skipping down to verse 13, this verse destroys the Trinity and modalism all in one. We are told the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, and yet verse 9 is an obvious description of Jesus, who is called the Ancient of Days. But well, we see in Revelation 1 that Jesus is called the Son of Man, whose appearance matches that of Daniel uh, 7, verse 9. So what is going on? Here is the tie-in. Um, you know, he has uh, Revelation chapters 4 and 5. We're not going to read it. You can read those two chapters because I'm uh, going to keep this study going here. But uh, he says in chapter 4, we have an obvious depiction of Jesus sitting on the throne. See glory of the Lord's study. Again, you can watch his study on that. Verse 8 proves this because this confirms Revelation 1, verse 4, and verse 8. This is the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne. In chapter 5, we see the Lamb appears. This has to be Jesus. Obviously, he's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But for, verse 1 talks about him that sat on the throne. Verse 7 then shows the Lamb coming to the throne of him and taking the book out of his hand. If you are a Trinitarian, then you would say this is two persons. Of course, that's what they do. However, when compared with Daniel 7, you see that Jesus sits on the throne, then he comes to him on the throne. <laughs> this then therefore means that the Son is the body, and him that sits on the throne must be the Father. This is separation of body and soul. And he says, I have no idea how this works, but this is what the Bible says. If you are a modalist, how does this then work? Modalism teaches that Jesus can only manifest himself, manifest in one different mode at a time, unless you get, you know, eternity and in time, you know, they try to make that there. Yet we see the two present simultaneously in heaven, in eternity. Yeah, so modalism is destroyed by that, by that Daniel chapter 7, their passage that we uh, read. To further show the tie-in, Daniel 7 references books being opened. This also ties in with Revelation 20. But here in chapter 5, a book is being opened. Revelation 5.11 is a direct quote from Daniel 7.10. This is the same event being described. Conclusively, the Son is the body. Yeah, it's right there. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. How could it be, you know, 
the Ancient of Days on the throne, the Son, one like unto the Son of Man comes to him. They're both Jesus. Uh, yes, Jesus is the Godhead. He is fully God. Okay? So, there in that passage, it's giving him as the Ancient of Days, and also as one like unto the Son of Man, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, coming together. It's kind of like the thing of Melchizedek. Um, Melchizedek is said to not have father, not mother, you know, not descent, nor, you know, you know, beginning of days, nor end of life, and all that stuff. And you say, well, that can't be Jesus, you know, because those things are, you know, whatever else. Well, it's talking about the Father and the Son as one being there. They're both fulfilling parts of that prophecy of, or that, that passage about Melchizedek. Same thing is going on here. Okay? I mean, if, if my soul does something, I can still claim that it's me. It's not some separate person or whatever else. I have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Okay, I can take credit for what my soul and spirit do. All right? And so it is with God. It's just one being there. Um, okay. The same phrase, like unto the Son of Man, can also be seen in Daniel 3, 24 through 28, when Jesus shows up in the fiery furnace. It is also used in Hebrews 7, verses 1 through 3, describing Melchizedek, who is Jesus, and has always existed and has always had a body. Again, references 1 John 4, 1 through 6. I really would like to see some of these Trinitarians come out and take the Antichrist spirit challenge. You know, confess publicly that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, if you want to prove to me that you don't have an Antichrist spirit. I think most of them are just going to try to ignore it and pretend that they didn't. Well, I didn't hear it. And yeah. So when the Bible talks about the Father sending the Son, it is referring to God sending His body to be the sacrifice for sins. God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, which proves the Messianic prophecy of God sending Himself as the sacrifice, found in Genesis 22, verse 8, John 1.29, and Acts 20.28. 20, All those scriptures tying in. Again, you know, this is what Bible-believing Christianity is, comparing scripture with scripture. All these references, all these tie-ins, um, that's what it's about. If you want little pretty animation and music and whatever else, well, some of that stuff's okay. I use some of that, some of those things in my own video production, but uh, you can't rely on that completely and wholly. Um, you need to get a King James Bible, and you need to actually be looking this stuff up and searching the scriptures, right? And if you ever watch somebody that is is not sitting there holding a Bible. And they're saying to you, well, this is what you should believe, and this is what, and they're not telling you to turn in your Bible. Um, watch out. Okay? Watch out. Um, Romans chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Okay, he has these typed out here. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Okay? Um, the likeness of sinful flesh, but Jesus never sinned. And what did he do? He went on to the cross, and that's where he became sin who knew no sin, right? But he took our sins on him, you see, that his righteousness could be imputed to you. And when Jesus' righteousness is imputed to you, it doesn't even change your sinful flesh. You just go on doing what you feel like doing without any conviction. <laughs> no, you know, Jesus' imputed righteousness is not a free pass to live in sin, you see. Just had to throw that in there. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and verse 32 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans chapter 9, verses 4 through 5 says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is over all. It doesn't say, well, he's the second member of the Trinity. He's 
just this lower down, you know, whatever else. And watch out for that Trinitarian stuff. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Okay. 1 John 4, verses 9 through 10, and then verse 14. And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. This then explains what is going on in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Being in the form of God refers to his glorious body he had, which explains how some people saw God in the Old Testament. The Son, the body, in other words, the body, took on humanity, not God sending a separate person with his own body, soul, and spirit. Again, that's heresy. And, and you know, Trinitarians, well, we don't really believe that. Yes, you do. If he's a separate person, then he has to have his separate body, soul, and spirit. A bunch of stinking heretics. If that's the case, then God lied when he said he would send himself. You know, God shall provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. One more important thing to take note of is this term called theophany, sometimes called a Christophany. Almost always when you hear a Trinitarian use that term, it is basically their little code word for, quote, this is obviously Jesus in the Old Testament, which destroys our doctrine, so we'll just pretend it's some sort of foreshadowing, but not the actual thing. Exactly. Look out for that philosophy. Uh, this conclusively proves that Jesus, the Son, is the body of Jehovah. Absolutely, 100% correct. You know, I don't, I don't really know what else to say. I mean, we've, we've hashed this thing out with Trinitarian heretics, and we've gone back and forth with them, and they come up with their arguments and whatever else. Um, you know, if you've seen all the different studies and you're still Trinitarian and, and things and you still hold on this added philosophy to explain who God is, you're in serious trouble with the Lord. It's just as simple as that. You're one of the disciples that walked no more with Jesus because they were offended when he said, you have to eat my flesh. Are you willing to eat the flesh of God? Are you willing to partake of that flesh? Are you willing to be satisfied with that flesh. How about that one? Well, the Bible says it. I believe it. Well, Trinitarian comes along. Well, the Bible is okay, but Godhead just isn't as clear as Trinity. And, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, three in one, you know, all this stuff. And, and the Father's not the Son, the Spirit's not the, the Father, the, you know, the Son's not the Spirit, all this stuff. We've got to make these little trichatra three-pointed star thing and all this stuff like this. You're not content with Jesus Christ. You're not content with the flesh of God. You have to have something different. You have to say, um, this thing of just Jesus being God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's all just in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God was manifest in flesh. I don't know about that. Boy, I sure, I sure don't know if I want to take that food because that's going to put me at odds with most Baptists and the Catholics of course and all the other Trinitarian Lutherans and the and the Methodists and the Presbyterians all these other people out there it's going to put me at odds because I'm going to have to go out and say that Jesus is the Father and the Son at the same time Jesus Christ is holy completely God he alone is worthy of your worship that's going to put me at odds with a lot of people I don't know if I can swallow that you see so I think maybe I'll go back to Egypt, where they have a trinity. Three separate persons, Isis, Osiris, and Horus. Or another way to say it, even more better than that, you know, more better. Even better than that, Isis, Horus, and Set. I-H-S. Be a good little Jesuit now, you know. I, I, see, I, I kind of like that. that. That tastes a little bit better to me. I want to go back to Egypt for my food, you see. I don't think I could swallow this thing that Jesus Christ is wholly, completely God. I don't know if I want the flesh of God truly in my life. That's what's going on there. That's what the whole thing is. And if you want to see what happens, uh, look what 
Look what God did to the children of Israel that wanted flesh other than manna. Hmm. God dropped them dead. God's going to drop you dead. If not physically, certainly spiritually, if you cling to this Trinitarian teaching and refu refuse in your pride to let go of that. That's going to be it. Thank you, brother, for sending that study. It was a very good one. Uh, I don't often do that. I don't often read other people's studies and things, but, you know, he sent that, and I prayed about it, and I said, yeah, you know what? I'm going to read that. I mean, I quote books and read books and things like that and, and, and go over some of that stuff, so I thought, well, okay, you know, I'll read this. And uh, very interesting. So that is going to be it. Um, some big announcements coming up in the future. Not going to say a whole lot about it right now, but uh, busy as always. Please do keep us in your prayers. Thank you to those that support the ministry. And uh, good stuff coming out in the future. So we'll see you in the next study.